Let's look now at Russia and Europe. You know, Brother Thomas wrote many years ago in Exposition of Daniel, he said this, Complications will doubtlessly arise in the West, Western nations, which may divert the attention of the Ottoman allies, NATO, from the Black Sea. This diversion will be Russia's opportunity. Something's going to divert the attention in the Western world. What is it? Oh, China's national security number th threat, number one, says America. The biggest army in the world. 1.6 million troops. Huge. The world is shaking. It's shaking as it looks at this. Here's another paper. USA says, China's now our biggest military th threat. China presents the biggest military th threat to the United States, according to the Pentagon. Staggering. They're scared. So are we. Here's what Mr Morrison plans to do. He spend, hopes to spend, in the next couple of years, $270 billion to arm Australia. They're terrified. Just only a week or so ago, China said we're going to build a huge port in Papua New Guinea. Oh, it's a fishing port. Everybody said it's rubbish. There's not fish, many fish around. It's just the nearest port to Australia, and they're going to spend $200 million to build it up. We are worried. Everybody is worried. People are being distracted from the Middle East, where the real issue is. So where's the problem coming from? Russia. Russia's developing weapons like this one. Nukes. Drop one of them on France, they said. We can wipe pretty well the whole of you out with one hydrogen bomb. Thousand times at least the size of an atom bomb. And we can vaporise cities. We can do the whole lot. Just one. So France, join up with us. Don't go, the, the Europe, go aligning with America. And so here we can see what Russia's doing. Back in the 1980s, 1989, her army was just almost decimated because of the poverty in Russia. But not now. Putin's new model army, look at the date, look at the paper. Leading paper economist says, the Russian military forces dazzle after a decade of reform. NATO will need to step up. Oh, wow. Look at the problem that's coming. So the military of Russia is growing and growing dramatically. So here's what the Europeans see. Russia about to gobble Europe. Vladimir Putin, encirclement of Europe. Russia has, uh, Russia that has managed to extend its reach along the front from the Baltic to the Mediterranean Europe is being encircled by Russia. Militarily. Here's an article that comes from quite about two years ago. But those figures are just current. Here is Russia threatening potentially to come into that area. NATO's got a huge, huge army. Huh, 200,000. Russia, huh, nearly four times bigger. Nearly four times bigger. And that's not the call-ups. Huge what's happening. And what about America? Surely America's going to come to the aid of Russia, uh, of Europe. Yeah. Well, look at the situation. They've got coronavirus hugely. I think, I oh know it was Britain, they were saying one person was dying every 10 minutes. Was it Britain or it might be America? It's huge. They are feeling very, very weakened by the situation that's taking place at the moment. And what about Russia? Well, Russia hacked in about a week ago, and has been hacking in for quite some time, but America didn't realise it, into American businesses, American military, into American power stations, you name it. Hit the Department of Defence, the State, the Treasury, the Energy, Agriculture, Homeland Security and Commerce. They said the hacking has a consequence that's even worse than Paul, Pearl Harbor. A huge great thing. A modern day cyber Pearl Harbor. 
Biden said this is an act of war. Well, we'll see what happens. But anyhow, a massive hacking from Russia into America. So what about America? It's weakened. Weakened dramatically. What about Britain? Ah, it's worrying too. It's worrying. Vladimir Putin's tide of terror. Russian naval incursions into British waters soar. Increased number of ships coming into Russia, into the British waters. Here's some of the British waters around here. And Russian ships have been coming in in increasing and increasing numbers. Just over the last couple of weeks, the British have sent out their navy 17 times to drive out Russian ships. They've sent out their air force, um, sent out their air force 11 times to drive out aircraft that are coming in. Russia said to them, don't ever shoot down any of our planes. We know it's over your territory. We're just going to make sure that on most of them is an atom bomb. So don't shoot us down, will you? And so they've continued to intimidate Amer Britain. So how's things in Britain? Well, let's ask this chap here. There he is. He is the British head of military. Chief defence man. Chief of the defence staff. He leads the military. Here's he's having an interview. There he is. And what's he saying? General Sir Nick Carter said the global economic crisis caused by COVID-19 could also trigger new security threats, even war. We see, you can see America's decimated. The door's open. What's going to happen? Well, here's a few other papers. We're going very quickly. Russia, China launched massive Caucasus, and we'll look at this in a little later, that is in just north of Turkey. Massive attack south of Russia. Then, here we are, the Times, December the 8th. Russia and Western envoys make joint plea to avoid war. Relations between Russia and NATO are at their lowest ebb since the end of the Cold War. Europe's terrified. It looks like war. It looks like a real military confrontation. The papers are full of it. We're not seeing it. We hear just one word. Coronavirus. It's blockading a lot of the information coming in. Here's Forbes magazine. Diplomatic and military experts warn that the West and Russia risk war. This month. That came out. So the situation is very scary. Here he is the leader of France, Mr. Macron. There he is, Emmanuel Macron. But look, student of the Jesuit school, a Vatican champion. And he rules France, brethren and sisters. He runs France today. He's influenced by the Roman Catholic Church. And you know, OK, it's late last year, but late last year he was already saying this. Brexit. Britain leaves. Right. Russia, you've got a chance to rebuild bridges with us. Realign with us. There's Macron's feeling. And now, at the start of... Late last year, this lady came into cha in charge of the EU. She was the ex-military head of Germany. Politician. Ursula von der Leyen. Ex-German defence minister. And she's come in and she controls the EU now. And what's her aim? She wants to form a United States of Europe. A little like ten toes coming together. All these states coming together, like the United States. Doesn't surprise us from Daniel chapter 2, does it? It's exactly what we would have expected. And which way are things moving now? Ha! Oh, here's Germany. Germany. Germany's already got a pipeline, a dedicated pipeline for her, of natural gas coming in from Russia. The second one's not quite finished. 
And now with Brexit almost ready to come apart, that's only a week or so ago, for it to be finished, into their waters came two huge ships loaded with pipes, ready to finish the second pipeline. America's furious about it. Said we'll boycott Germany because of this. We told them it shouldn't go ahead that way. They're allying with Russia. And so the Nordic Two Stream aims to double the size of Russian gas shipments to Germany. The pipeline could increase Europe's reliance on Russian gas. So that's why America's so disturbed by it. And they've got every reason to. Here's a cartoon. But it was put in a significant paper. It picks up the picture clearly. Here's Mr. Trump. Here's Mrs. Merkel, leader of Germany. Here's Mr. Putin. Ha, huh. and this is, no, I'm not sure of that one. <laughs> we'll talk about it in a minute. Well, there we go. Here's the pipeline. And as a consequence, she is kissing Putin. They're united. They're coming together. That's the way the papers are seeing it. And at the same time, Britain, Europe has not got the money to run NATO, so they're sending the bill to Trump, or Biden now, presumably. And America's furious. And so these two are getting closer and closer together, as we know it will. As we know it will in Daniel's image. So we can see the situation developing. Well, Russia sent, military aid, uh, sent medical aid to Italy at the start of the year when Italy was badly hit by coronavirus. Out of those big planes coming in were containers and on the sides of it, the containers were from Russia with love. And shortly afterwards, those two got together. Mr. Putin and the Prime Minister of Italy getting together. And then, having spoken to the Prime Minister of Italy, he went around to the shack behind where the Prime Minister lived. There it is. And this was Putin's sixth time he visited a Pope. There it is. Interesting. And so the alliance is building, brethren and sisters, the alliance is building rapidly. Milit religiously, it's already established. Russian Orthodox and Roman Catholicism in close relationship already. It's like the two feet. Clearly coming together. As well as that, he's moving. Look what he is saying. The Pope's new dream. Look at the date. November this year. For the first time in its 50 year history, the Catholic Church has asked all member states of the European Union to adopt the policies of Rome. Rome. Pope Francis' message read in part, I dream of Europe that is a family and a community. Babylon, the mother of many harlots. Joining together. It's coming, brethren and sisters. But now, what about Russia? Well, 2nd of July this year, Putin had an election. And he won a landslide election. His name wasn't in the voting papers. It was cooked. It was cooked. And so, one wonders what's going to happen. After this, they've said, well, he's very ill. Got Parkinson's disease. Not quite, you know. Somebody else is obviously going to have to take over. And so the Western world's put to sleep by this. They're not quite so afraid as they thought they should be over Russia. Is that a surprise to us? Daniel chapter 8 verse 25 says, By his cunning he shall make deceit to prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Is that true? Here's the Australian earlier this year. Evil at the heart of Russia. Indeed, he is indeed very, very powerful. Look what he has gained through this election. President Vladimir Putin is manoeuvring to have himself installed as a ruler for life in Russia. And he got that. He got that vote. Nor is the EU likely to do more than mutter. 
as Putin glues himself to the throne. Throne. Amazing. And of course, Russia is very concerned over what's happening here. Hagia Sophia, Brother Thomas, when he wrote Elpis Israel, had a cover letter on it that he sent it to the British government, all about Hagia Sophia and Russia taking control of it because they would turn it into a mosque. And it has been. Only in a few days ago. There's the date. And Russia is hugely concerned over it. What could happen to Hagia Sophia will cause deep pain amongst the Russians. And it is. Because of their religion. Well, let's move on. Scripture tells us of a massive invasion of the land of Israel. We don't need the Bible. <laughs> Somebody else told us he's going to do that. Here we are. Vladimir Putin is set to lead Russia politically for the rest of his life and is warning at the same time of a catastrophic Middle East war in the near future. Are we ready? Well, already they're moving. Remember this area, here's Turkey, here's Iran, here's the Caspian Sea. Early this year, that huge invasion took place into this area. First of all, Russia put down there a thousand crack troops, well-trained, MiG fighters, you name it, and stimulated fighting. 2,000 people from this area lost their lives. And then Russia moved in again and sent down there into that area troops. Into the area of Tagama, so to speak, and took control of that area. Sent 2,000 and brought peace. And the paper said, who's the victor of the Nogorno Karabakh fighting Putin? And what did the Jews say? Well, it's very interesting because through here, from the Caspian, comes four pipelines of oil for Europe. One of which goes down through here and is piped into Europe and Israel. Israel's got plenty of natural gas, but not oil. 40% comes from here. Russia could turn 40% of the oil off like that for Israel. So what do we expect? Do we expect Russia to invade Turkey now? Elpis Israel, we expected it before Christ's return, but Brother Thomas changed his view. He said, we have not to wait the advance of the Russian Gog against Constantinople. He said, that will happen after Christ's return. Otherwise, we'd be stirred up. He comes at a time, you think not. Well, please, brethren, don't be like that. Listen carefully to the signs. But further to that, we expect Russia to be allied with Persia. What's Persia? It's Iran. In that area around Iran, America has pulled out more, almost all of its troops and blew, blown up its bases. Got them out to America. The hospitals there are hopeless. They said if any of our troops get coronavirus, they might as well be home. I know they're jammed, but at least we'll get proper treatment, pull most of them out. So their troops were these numbers. This is where they were, and not anymore. Well, what's going on now? Trump sought options for attacking Iran before he stood down. Because Iran said, as Trump stood down, we've actually broken the rules. In regard to the treaty we signed with America on nuclear power, we've got 12 times more than we said we had. 12 times more uranium. And we've got, high, we've got our centrifuges going flat out. We're ready for things. So Trump said, let's hit them. And the military advisor said, don't. Leave it to Biden. But the paper said they won't. The likelihood is Israel will strike into, your, into that area. Already Israel has done so. He is a, the top of a nuclear facility. It's pretty hopeless. But underneath it was huge. And look at it. Underground, Israel somehow did it, it would seem, and blew that up. So you see, it's amazing what Israel is. It dwells safely, margin, confidently. They actually wrote a letter to the Iranians before they attacked and said, we have missiles that are so precise that they can hit within less than a metre of exactly the site we want to hit. Probably, you know, there's a stairway. Boom, down there went the missile. 
and blew it up. They dwell confidently. Look, they have brought out this year, or it might be late last year, a new laser beam. They said, this laser beam is so good, it doesn't miss. They sent a missile in from Iran, missile in from any of the countries. We will burn it out. It will not miss. Then, early this year, no, late last year, Russia brought their very best missiles in and put them along the border with Israel. S-400s. And Israel got on the telephone. They, the Russians said, don't fly over us or we'll blow you up. So Israel got on the telephone and phoned up the Greeks because they'd bought the missile from Russia. And they said, switch off the missile and just switch on the radar and we'll come over in the next three days and see if you can see us. They went over that night. They, flew, they got on the telephone again to Greece and said, did you see anything? No, no, you haven't come yet. Ah, oh, we haven't come yet. So it's true. There's Stratforce, not seen on Russian radar. Nobody knows how they do it, but they're not seen. And the consequence was, coming back, sorry, 20 Iranian targets were hit the next morning. Boom, boom, boom. By Israeli aircraft and they flew home. Right across the Russian missiles. So I'm joking. The Russian missiles wrapped up in you know, plastic, little note on it, and they were sent home and said they need to be upgraded. Israel, they don't work here. Israel was hacked into some of their power stations and such like by the Iranians. Ha! So Israel hacked, cut it out within hours, stopped the hacking, and then they hacked this port here. It stopped the whole port for a week. The cranes weren't moving, the ships were whirling in trying to find somebody berth, nothing. Traffic lights, red, red, red. Cars way up over the hills for a week. They said, Israel did it. Would we do that, said Israel? Well, it's believed we did. And then the top man developing nuclear weapons, his car got blown up. And they blame Israel for that. Then the next week, the head of the military in Iraq, the Iranian head in Iraq, he got killed. Clear message, isn't it? We can do it. We are powerful. We are coming. And we will achieve it. But you see, on the other side, many nations are very afraid in the Middle Eastern area of the Iranian nuclear weapons. Here's some of them. They're joining up with Israel. It's the Abraham Accord. You see, they're saying, America can't defend us. Who can? Israel only. It's got the skills, the nuclear power. It's got the wisdom. It's got the missiles. They can defend us. So let's ally with them. Before, Russia, before Iran takes us. So here we can see Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, with the help of Mr. Putin, no, Mr. Trump, Allying with Israel, there it is, the beginning of the Abraham Alliance. But it hasn't stopped there. Sudan's united with them. Sudan and now Morocco. It's growing all the time. And I believe there's another one on the way. We'll talk about it in a minute. But in the Middle East, there's a time clock. It's a time clock for us, brethren and sisters, that we need to watch. Ezekiel 37, we ought to number them, has got six steps. The first four have happened. The next one must happen. Look, come back to it. The mountains of Israel have got to come under Israeli control. Right at this moment, they're saying amongst the Palestinians, the coronavirus has just gone rampant. They need Israeli hospitals. They don't want to go there. It's rampant. Who, what can they do? It looks like the West Bank, which Israel is already occupying, got half a million of their people already in there, will be taken over. And if that's the case, come back to that quote. So the mountains of Israel, the West Bank, 
comes under Israel's control. And what's the next step? Huh. One king shall be king to them all. Christ's return. How long have we got, brethren and sisters, young people? It's a time to be deadly serious about the word of God. Time to be deadly serious about it. We know what's going to happen. There in the Middle East, Russia has already come into that area. It came in in the year 2015, exactly predicted in the scriptures and interpreted that way by one of our brethren back in 1941. And so, brethren and sisters, Damascus now is in ruins. Not all of it, but those people, some of that area is in ruins. Fulfilling Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1. But brethren and sisters, it's not going to stay there. Russia has already come into the Middle East. It's come into Damascus. It's allied there with the leader of the Syrians, Assad. And now, into that area, they've moved a base, a huge base. A huge base, 85 kilometres away from Israel's border. And on that Israeli border, they've now got troops. Between them... And Israel is the United Nations troops. Do you know where they draw their troops from? That group of United Nations? They come from two countries, Australia and Fiji. They are on that border there between Russia and Israel. Commonwealth countries, somewhat. And so things are moving in the Middle East. Has it stood still since Russia moved in there? Well, let's see. Here we are earlier this year. Look at it. Ships were coming through the Bosphorus, brethren and sisters. They were coming into this area here, loaded with weapons. They were looking at that particular ship. It was carrying 150 tanks that they could see coming into the Middle East, and they haven't stopped coming. Only trickle of them, but when you bring them all together, it's a lot that are coming into the Middle East. Huge consequences. What are they expecting? We know what they're preparing for. To invade Egypt and then indeed the Battle of Armageddon. So here we are, Daniel chapter 11, verse 20, 42 to 43. Russia comes into the Middle East, but what is the reason? He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver. And over all the precious things of Egypt, the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So Russia is going to move into that area for a financial reason. Very interesting, really, what's going on at the moment. Of course, we know that Egypt is rich in gold and they're mined by very much the Russian companies. But I believe it's more than that. We'll talk about it in a minute. But when Russia went into there, one of the areas they moved into is Libya. They had a conflict there with some of the Turks who were also supporting the opposite side, but that seems to be resolved. And now Russia controls, if it wishes to, the oil coming out of Tur Libya. Remember, it went into the area of Nagorno-Karabakh, or uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, just north of Turkey, controls those four pipelines there. Now it controls the Libyan supply of oil. And now, as well as that, they have moved into the area of Egypt. More we'll talk about that in a minute. But just recently, they determined to build a base here. They've already got a base down here. And so has China. They can control the Red Sea. What's so interesting about the Red Sea? Oh, here's the biggest fields in the area, Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia pumps its oil across there, up there. So if you control that Red Sea, you can control Saudi Arabia's oil. It pumped across here, put in tanks and pumped to the Suez Canal, and then because the tankers are so big, they can't go through the Suez Canal, it's pumped parallel to the Suez Canal, into the Mediterranean ships, and then to Europe. 
Systematically, they're cutting off the oil. Two years ago, they did the largest military manoeuvre in Europe seen for years. 300,000 soldiers up near the borders of Norway that controls half the North Sea oil. Britain, the other half. A message very loud and clear, Norway. You submit to what we do or look out. So you can see almost all of the oil coming out of that area can be controlled by Russia. From Kuwait, it goes through Iraq into Syria and put ships, uh, ports there. Russia can control it just like that. Europe's learning very, very much that lesson we saw in that cartoon. Remember Mrs. Merkel kissing Putin? If you want the oil to flow and the gas to flow, you'd be friendly with Russia. Well, somebody's breaking the rules. United Arab Emirates align with Israel. They used to send their oil through here, through the Suez Canal. But they decided that looks terribly dangerous. Terribly dangerous. It might easily get cut off, so this is what they're doing now. They're sending it through to Elat. There's a United Arab Emirates ship coming into Elat. And then they're pumping it from Elat through to Ashkelon and then putting it in ships to Europe. That will be provocative to Russia. That will not make Russia pleased. But things are changing, brethren and sisters. Here's something that only came up one day ago. You know, one of the areas I've always been thinking about, it doesn't seem to be fitting in the place. When Sheba or Yemen going to ally itself with the western side and Israel? Well, this is what's happened. Look at the date. Yemen's new government sworn in, ending months of wrangling. In Yemen, there's three parties that really can taking control of the country. Two of them who are normal moderate people, groups, and the last one's the Houthi rebels armed by Iran. Saudi Arabia came into this area and got hold of the other two groups and said, you've got to unite and come under our help. We'll help you. And they did so that date. There they come together. And who is it? Yemen's new unity government was sworn in at Riyadh. The anti-Houthi bloc. There's the anti-Iranian bloc. They're going to oppose that with the support of Saudi Arabia. We want the capital Aden to be free of military units. Sure. Security services must carry out their duties. We do not want conflicts after today. So, Houthi, listen to us. Or you're going to really cop it. No more blood. One enemy, the Houthis. So no conflict between us. We're united and we're going to oppose that Houthi and we will support things. And of course, as we know, Sheba and Dedan, along with Tarshish and the Young Lions, will be allied. And the framework appears to have been established yesterday. Amazing. Amazing. And what about Egypt? Well, late last year, Soki... Um, a summit was held there and El Sisi, that's the head of Egypt, invited Putin down huh? to a huge meeting. Huge meeting when 43 African leaders from all over Africa came there and they said, we're forming a trading group which is going to be the Suez Canal Economic Group. Russia and African countries. And just to support that idea, they fill a few planes all through Africa to various different countries. Here's some landing in South Africa, capable of carrying atom bombs if they want to. It was a clear message to Africa. Stay united with me, with Russia. So the days are short. Now, by way of conclusion, come with me again to Isaiah 24. But I want to look at three verses in the midst of that that are aside. Brother Mansfield says this, these are beautiful words that apply to us particularly. Verses 13 to 17. Now I'm going to put another rendering up on the screen. 
The ESV has it this way. They, that's us, lift up their voices. They, sing for joy. As we see what we've seen tonight, we sing for joy. Why? We know the kingdom's coming. Over the majesty of Yahweh, they shout for, from the west. There we are, America, Canada. Therefore in the east, give glory to Yahweh in the countries of the sea. That's us. Give glory to the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. From the ends of the earth, we hear songs of praise of glory to the righteous one. So we can see, there's our spirit, brethren and sisters. Then he returns to the grim scene that's taking place in the Middle East and finally concludes with those beautiful words which we had read to us a few moments ago. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun shall be ashamed when Yahweh of armies shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his glory, his ancients gloriously. Well, what should we be doing? Well, we know these words off by heart. We should be, brethren and sisters, making sure we're following those three steps. Believing the gospel, truly having a sound faith in God's word. Then, certainly being baptised and living our baptism now, day by day. We're reminded of it on a Sunday morning, aren't we? The putting away of the flesh and dedicating ourselves to Christ and to God and continue faithfully until he comes. If we do that, then certainly we're going to see the kingdom. We will see, won't we, that wonderful prospect this earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Brethren and sisters, I appeal to you, watch and be ready. Don't go to sleep. How long is it going to be? It looks like it could be just around the corner. It's coming so fast. Is there anything else that needs to be fulfilled except for the Lord's return? It's almost there. Thank you.